Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the How to Be a Happy and Healthy Caregiver Telesummit. My name is Dave Sheldon. I'm uh, your co-host along with Dr. Ina Gilmore, uh, who, uh, of course, is the uh, founder of Caregiving with Purpose and and, uh, the sponsor of this event as well. Uh, And uh, tonight we've been talking with uh, Janet Edmondson and Tom and Karen Brenner, and we're getting ready for a call now with Cynthia Gardner O'Neill. We have a great lineup coming for you uh, again tomorrow night as well as Thursday night uh, at the same time, so we certainly hope that you'll be here for those. Uh, However, right now, it's just about time for us to begin uh, our final presentation for this evening with Cynthia Gardner O'Neill. And uh, the title of, of what we're going to be talking about here, what we're going to be doing is called The Heart of Caregiving. And tonight you're going to experience five ways to increase the quality of life for both you, the caregiver, and receiver through a change of heart. Now, what Cynthia calls heart monics, and you're going to be hearing lots more about that, the heart monics of your heart is where to start a change of heart, to be the life you love. And you know, the number one killer disease of men and women is heart disease. So please do not let this happen to you. Your heart's health is the most important part of being a caregiver. And a change of heart will change your mind so that you can have a happier, healthier life and a greater quality of living for yourself and who you're giving care to. Now, Cynthia Gardner O'Neill harmonizes lives through leading technology, wellness education, and the power of the spoken word. Illumination through education is the path to harmonizing life. And her credentials include being a wellness and life coach, massage therapist, flower essence practitioner, wilderness guide, TFT trainer, complementary and alternative medicine professional, bioacoustic research scientist, as in in the process of getting her Doctor of Divinity. Now, Cynthia (laughs) has written articles, newsletters, e-books, published books, and created a website for harmonizing body, heart, soul, spirituality, and your business. She lectures, teaches workshops, blogs, socially shares, and provides loving service, harmonizing lives. And Cynthia's mission for the Center of Loving Consciousness is a sustainable, well community that grows rapidly, one healthy person at a time with loving consciousness. And she's here tonight to share all of that and more. Welcome, Cynthia. Well, thank you, David. Wow, I I supplied you with a lot of information there, didn't I? And I was thinking it was going to be a little bit shorter. And and, and there's more. I have a feeling we're going to be learning more. Uh, Well, I so appreciate and thank both of you, Dr. Ina Gilmore and yourself for having me here and bringing me on. And to start with, I just kind of like to let everybody know, you know, uh, this about what I'm here to share with you, the heart of caregivers, you and so many of us, there's caregivers are all of us. It's your, the mother, the father, the friend, the person absolutely taking care of those who are going through illness and disease and troublesome times. And, you know, we all have that opportunity to be a caregiver and to give from our hearts and, and to keep our hearts healthy so that we can also provide that opportunity to harmonize our lives through waves of emotions and to help also the people we're caring for to harmonize their life. And, you know, I've been listening to all of these people who have been here to uh, support this Happy and Healthy Caregiving Telesummit. And every single one of them, I love everything that they talk about, about where we go to help ourselves thrive and have a better quality of life is into our hearts, such as we were talking about singing and poems and about, you know, play and all those kind of things that make us happy and joyous. And those are what are transforming all of us, our hearts, the caregiver, the care receiver, and keeps us all thriving and happy and healthy. The reason why I'm talking about harmonizing ways of emotions is because emotions can, they can feel like demons sometimes. And I found that there's a lot of research data out there that shows that caregivers are more emotionally distressed and have poor immune function than non-caregivers. And it's time to harmonize your heart for a happier, healthier life, for a greater quality of living for yourself and those you care for. And so that's what I'm here for. 
But first I want to start out by telling you guys about what brought me to this place of all of studies that I've done and the degrees and the um, the research, being a bioacoustic research scientist, also a bio, um, a energy informatic research scientist, which is about studying frequencies, basically. And right now, I live an incredible life. I'm happy. I'm healthy. Um, I'm a wilderness outfitter so that I can take people into nature and help them experience a new way of being, help them discover the love that they are. And I take people into the wilderness on horseback so they can start feeling again because there's nothing better to be in, than being in nature to help us heal, to help us recognize what unconditional love is and who we are, to let go of what interferes, and that's our inner fears, with knowing who we are and with our heart and helping and nature harmonizes our hearts. It is... It is a remedy for our wellness. My life hasn't always been this. When I was a kid, young, my, my father died when I was seven. And shortly after that, a few years after that, my mother remarried a man who actually married us for the money that we received from my father's death. And during that time, I was raped and sexually abused and beaten for about four years of my life. And during that time, I was paralyzed for a short time. I also had pneumonia consistently. I had strep. And in fact, the strep ended up being in my bones and my blood in my bones. And they actually you know, didn't know why I was paralyzed. They had all kinds of ideas, but I knew. I knew what it was. It was my protective mechanism to take care of myself by disconnecting from myself. So when I was sick, the, the abuse stopped. It kept me safe. And so as I went through, uh, it was until I was like 16 years old, when I finally left home, and I moved to the mountains of Colorado. That's where I grew up, is in Colorado. And my father, before he died, I was with him, you know, from birth to seven years old. And he was a geologist, paleontologist. And so we were always in nature. We were always in the outdoors. We would be going to mines and researching the, and going to the mountains and everything. And he also was a fly fisherman. And, you know, we, we camped out every weekend and we were always hiking and, and being in the wilderness and camping and all those things. And that was just an amazing time for me. So when I finally was able to escape, so to speak, from the, my childhood trauma, I moved to the mountains and my life changed big time when I made, when I took this adventure and I call it a wilderness adventure into my heart to discover who I was. And when I came up into the mountains and started changing my environment, letting go of the negativity that was around me, I began to flourish. In fact, the illnesses that I had fell away. And my heart just expanded out. And there's a lot more that happened to me when I was a kid and through my father's death that something was going on with my heart, that I was feeling really deep what other people were feeling. And they call me an empath because I can feel what people are feeling. I can feel um, when they're in pain. I can feel their happiness and joy. I can feel their love. And to an extent that I also was feeling um, even my father who transitioned heart. And that's what supported me through the trauma I went through. So I came to a point in my life where I was like thinking to myself, now, why do I have this experience when other people don't? And what is this experience that I'm having? And so I went on this wilderness adventure to find out more about what this was all about. So it took me on a journey, an adventure into finding out more about what these frequencies were, what my heartbeat was telling me, what my body was expressing, what my emotions, which is energy in motion, which is what our heartbeat is. And so that's why I'm here today and why I've gone to the levels of learning about even bioacoustics, which is the the bio sounds of, of humans. And so learning about that, I learned that the sound of our voice can tell the state of our health. And 
I'm not going to get into all these things tonight because I'm going to give you a lot of information, a lot of heart knowledge, and which will help transform your ways of emotions just by learning about this knowledge. So my question is, are you harmonizing through waves of emotions? And so what we're going to do here today is I'm going to teach you five ways to harmonize the quality of life for both you and your care, who you give care to through a change of heart. And we're going to discover the five stressors facing all caregivers and how to avoid them. Ah, and as you heard David earlier, the, what I am sharing with you, I call harmonics. And harmonics of the heart is where to start a change of heart. So a change of heart is where harmony begins. And this is what I was telling you about my own life. All of a sudden, I had this change of heart because I moved away from a, an experience that I was having, having that was very discordant. And I moved into a place of harmony by just changing my environment. So first, we're going to start off with heart awareness. This is one of five of the levels that really make a difference to learn who you are and how the heart supports you. To have heart awareness, number one thing I'd like to bring in here is the number one killer disease of humanity is heart disease. And a lot of people think it's cancer and things like that, but I want you to know the heart is the central communicator of every single cell in your body, every single cell. It communicates with everything. And so cancer, we have different levels of cancer that we talk about, which is actually the cell that it's affecting. So breast cancer, it affects the breast cells. And so that's what we name each one of the cancers. It has to do with what cell that the cancer is affecting. But no, heart disease, since it is the number one killer disease of humanity, what I'm going to show you is some information about the heart and how powerful the heart is. And that my belief is if we solve the dis-ease of the heart, we will solve all dis-ease. And my question for you, if we find the cause of a disease, would we need a cure? So that's something to think about while we're moving through this information that I'm sharing with you. So as a caregiver, you do not want to be next. And so that's why I'm here sharing this information with you. There's five stressors facing all caregivers that are affecting their hearts. Number one I have here is genetics. And you might think to yourself, why would genetics be a stressor? And really, you know, caregivers offer often wonder whether they or their children will also face debilitating diseases because they've been told that, that this is genetic, that it's genetically transmitted. And so that can add a lot of stress onto a caregiver to think that it may be moving into affecting family members and, and all of that. So then we have guilt and a lot of guilt comes up from, you know, giving care and not sure whether you're going to be able to do a good enough job or if you're doing it right or all kinds of things comes up there. And then we have worry. Now, worry, I always say worry is like praying for what you don't want. And worry, and you might say, well, where's fear here? Well, worry is more consistent. It is a daily thing that people go through. They're constantly worrying about their children, worrying about if they're caring for the right way or what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next day. And so worry is a very consistent emotion that goes on for the caregiver. And then we have social support. And with social support, you know, a lot of times caregivers get isolated and they don't have the social activities that they normally would have and things like that. And just, so that can come in being separated from others and feeling all alone. I'm going to teach you a little bit more about how to overcome that. And then um, the financial burdens that come up. We all know the financial burdens that can come with um, illnesses and disease and sick children and all those kind of things. And so what can we do to overcome those kind of things? So um, I'm going to start off with an experience here. I'm going to tell you about... Um, 
I am a wellness provider with all the knowledge that I have, and I have some patients, clients that usually I get called in when people are kind of in a place where people have given up on them. And the story I'm going to share with you right now is about a young man who got MS, and he was at a point where he was debilitated and he was in, in bed and and he was a witty, witty guy and funny and everything like that. And so I was asked to come in because of my positive outlook on life and about my loving consciousness. And what I love to do is change the quality of life for people who are in a position where they don't feel that there's anything for them. And I was brought into Matt, and the first day that I entered the room, I saw him, and I could see the sparkle in his eyes. And I looked at him, and the first thing I said was, hey, what's well about you? Can you tell me what's well about you? And he looked at me, and he said, what are you talking about? And I said, just tell me something that's well about you. And he said, well, I have MS. And I said, I didn't ask you what you had. I asked you what's well about you. And he says, well, I don't understand that question. And I said, okay, right now you're talking to me and you have a wonderful voice. I love the sound of your voice. That's well about you, right? And he's like, well, yeah. Yeah, I can. I can talk very easily. And I said, yeah. And I said, and you can hear me, can't you? And he's like, yeah, I can hear you. And he goes, in fact, I can hear the nurse in the other room talking about me sometimes. And I said, yeah, you kind of, you know, eavesdrop on everybody around here. And he's like, oh, yeah, I can hear everything that goes on around here. I said, well, that's well about you. And he's like, yeah. And so as I started pointing out these things that were well about him, I all of a sudden saw this brightness start coming up. And I could feel his heart all of a sudden feeling something new about himself because everybody around him who came in were focused on his illness. They were focused on the things that, um, you know, how to take care of them, what's happening here and what's happening there, but no one really looked at him and said, what's well about you? What is good? And the other thing that he said to me, he started he started saying, hey, you know, when I came to him the next time, he goes, hey, I started writing, I started, because um, he couldn't write, actually, he said, I, he had a little note, um, one of those uh, recorders, so he could record some things. And he goes, I um, made some notes on what's well about me. And you could already feel he was changing inside of himself instead of seeing himself as this um, individual who couldn't do anything, who was worthless possibly, and all those kind of things. And he started seeing his value and his worth and what he could do and what he could bring to the world still where he was at. And what was really funny is the caregiver who took care of him, she, he was so honorary and he hated life. He was just in a place where, in fact, they called me because they had, were having a really hard time dealing with him and could be so hateful and spiteful and everything about the situation that he was in. And when I started working with him and sharing, reading stories about love and about the love that you are, it was one uh, book that I read all the time, and I read a story about the, the butterfly, uh, the triumphant butterfly, telling him about, the, the I'm going to share that story with you that helped him learn so much about himself, was the triumph butterfly that I shared with him is about there were some kids that were coming to school, and on their way there was a little branch that had fallen and had a cocoon on it. And they thought, oh, how cool, let's just bring this to class. So they brought it into class and they gave it to the teacher. And the teacher got a little jar and put the... Um, the cocoon in there, and they poked holes in the top of the, the jar. And every day the kids would come in and watch the cocoon to see whether the butterfly was going to be coming out. And eventually one day, all of a sudden they could see it just shivering and shaking and everything as the butterfly was trying to get out of the cocoon. 
And instead, what and everybody started worrying about the um, the trauma that the that the butterfly was going through to try to get out of the cocoon. Well, the teacher pulled out the the branch with the cocoon on it, and they decided to cut open the cocoon. And when they did, the butterfly you see him stretch out one wing and then the other wing, and he started coming out and he started walking along the desk. But the butterfly didn't fly. And as they all kind of waited and everything to see if the butterfly would fly, it didn't fly at all. And they got concerned about what's going on with the butterfly. Well, they go to the science teacher and they say, what happened? This butterfly isn't flying or anything. And the science teacher would take a look at it, and they could see also that the butterfly was beginning to die. And the science teacher had to say to the children, he said, I'd like to talk to you about what happened here. The butterfly, since you didn't allow for the butterfly to strengthen its wings, the struggle to come out of the cocoon was what helps the butterfly strengthen its wings so it can fly. So the challenges that we go through are what are strengthening our souls, who we are, and what we're here for. And this is something, when I read this story, and I could watch him understand that something inside of him was telling him there's something more that he was here to do through his challenges. And he began to change and see his worth and how he could change within himself to find that that quality within him, that peace inside of him, that harmony inside of him. And he began to change and become, share his happiness and joy for who he is inside. Because he had all kinds of jokes he liked to tell. He was very witty. And people started to laugh when they were around him rather than him be angry at the place that he was at. So as I heard a lot of the presenters today talk about play and talk about sound, you know, music and all those kind of things, he started having more of that in his life. And you could see him change. The caregiver who was there, same thing. She started to be introduce more of that happiness and joy into his life also and into her own because she was burning out. She didn't know how to take care of him anymore because he was so hard to get along with. So just the change of perception was what made a difference in both of their lives, and it went on from there. I brought that story up because actually what changed within them was also their heart, the coherence of the heart. Now, the heart, the heart cell, the embryonic heart cell is the first cell upon our conception. The first organ is the heart. And when we go to find out, you know, what that little, what's going on in there when we check for to see if you're pregnant or not, we hear the heartbeat. Now, the heartbeat is the signature sound of you. And the heartbeat, what's really amazing about the heartbeat and the heart the heart is 60 times more amplified than your brain. The amplification of what's going out from your heart is going out to the world. And then the heart is 5,000 times more electromagnetic than any part of your body also. And what that means is what you're putting out, you're getting back 100 times plus. So I say to people, the state of your being, let it be love. Because if two people are doing the same laboring job, the exact same laboring job, and one of them is bitching and moaning and groaning about this laboring job, that I can't take this, this sucks. And the other one is doing the same exact laboring job, but is happy. And, And he's so grateful that he has a job. You know, I often um, share, um, I have two boys, and they're like yin and yang. And um, both my boys, were when they started to drive, the, um, the oldest of them would say, gosh, I can't believe how expensive gas is getting. 
this is ridiculous. I don't know how I'm going to afford it. And my younger son, he would say, oh, man, I, I don't even know how much gas start, uh, costs because I'm just grateful I have money to get gas. They're like, their perception was like night and day. So, and then bringing that up because in our hearts, our perception of life is what we're feeling inside of ourselves. And I always say, no feeling, no healing. And we feel first before we think. So we're always hearing about the brain being where everything comes from. And really, everything starts in the heart and then goes to the brain. And as I said earlier, the heart is the central communicator of every single one of our cells. Now, I want to share a little story with you. Pull that out here real quick. There is a great power within you, greater than the forces of fear or any of the blockages that might have been installed against your happiness. Huge bodies of evidence now confirm the existence of a vital link between our spirit, mind, body, and emotions. The following is a fascinating experience conducted by the Institute of Heart Math. In this experiment, some human DNA was placed in a container from which they could measure subtle changes in cellular structure. 28 vials of DNA were given, one each, to 28 trained researchers. Each researcher had been trained how to generate and feel feelings, and they each had strong emotions. It was discovered that the DNA changed its shape according to the feelings of the researchers. When the researchers felt gratitude, love, and appreciation, the DNA responded by relaxing and the strands unwound. The strands of the DNA became longer. Number two, when the researchers felt anger, fear, frustration, or stress, the DNA responded by tightening up. The strands became shorter and switched off many of our DNA codes. If you've ever felt shut down by negative emotions, this may explain why your body was equally shut down. The shutdown of the DNA codes was reversed and the codes were switched back on again when feelings of love, joy, gratitude, and appreciation were felt by the researchers. This experiment was later followed up by testing HIV patient, uh, positive page, patients. They discovered that feelings of love, gratitude, and appreciation created 300 thousand times more disease resistance than those without the positive feelings. Emotional input can go far beyond the effects of neurological signals to the body. Individuals trained in deep love were able to actually change the shape of their DNA. Essentially, this report confirms that we influence our bodies and the whole web of creation through our emotional vibration, and this was uh, from a paper entitled Local and Non-Local Effects of Coherent Heart Frequencies and Conformational Changes of DNA. So this experiment gives us substantial evidence that we create our reality by choosing it with our feelings. Our feelings activate our future and integrate it with the web of creation around us. This, in turn, connects to all the energy and matter of the universe. Emotional and spiritual energy can cause profound changes in human performance. This energy is woven into a web surrounding your body, which connects with all matter, time, and space. The center of this web, on an individual level, is the human heart. The heart marks the presence of an even more perfect center that many believe to be the sacred heart. In discovering this center, you are acquiring access to the command center of your life where you will find answers to help you stay well, no matter what dreadful virus or bacteria may be floating around. By staying in feelings of joy, love, gratitude, and appreciation, your life will immeasurably improve. Our physical heart is, an, is the organ most perfectly created to facilitate and support 
an integration of body, mind, spirit, and emotions and to give command signals to our life. So, hmm, pretty interesting there. Do you have any questions, information to add to that if you feel so called? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's actually, that's actually um, <clears throat> pretty amazing. I, hadn't, um, I haven't read that study yet, but I, I'm re- writing it down so that I can uh, look it up. Yeah, I um one of the studies that really astounded me was um have you heard of the Nun study? Yes, I have. And um I'd love for you to share that. Okay. That's a that's a study of um and you may have taken something else from it than I did, so you know, feel free to uh-huh. jump in. Um yeah. that was a study of I believe 678 cloistered nuns who they they studied um years after they entered the convent. Now these they're cloistered, so they had the same living environment, they ate the same food, they even basically wore the same clothes. And they had studied what these women wrote when they came into the, um, when they became nuns. They all wrote an essay, and they divided them into uh, groups, four groups, which ranged from the most cheerful to the least cheerful. And what they found was the women that were in the most cheerful group on average lived 10 years longer than those who were in the least cheerful group. And this was particularly evident um, by the time they reached um, 80, age 85. I think the numbers, the numbers were um, 90% of the group that was most cheerful were still alive and 34% of the least cheerful were still alive, and well, it was so. So that's huge, you know. That, that maybe cheer, lifelong cheerfulness, you know, uh-huh. can, can make a big difference in in your longevity. And the and the other thing that came out of the study was all of the all of the nuns agreed to have their brains studied after they passed, after they died. And they had 15 nuns who showed evidence. Um, on the study, that is on the microscopic study of Alzheimer's. They were all in the most cheerful group and none of them had any symptoms of Alzheimer's before they died. Yes. Which is just, I mean, not only are they living, are these people living longer, they're also healthier, and, you know, if you're cheerful and and if you get the disease, if you get the that it shows up on the microscope, it's it's entirely possible that um, you won't show any symptoms of it. So mm-hmm. it's just as if you didn't have the disease. Yes. And I have a wonderful story to follow up to that story oh, great. to help people understand that even more. So let me just pull this up and have a little help for myself here too. So I wrote an article. Um, it was, it's called The Human Powers of Compassion. And I wrote this article because, um, you know, since I love to study about frequencies and cells and, and I love studying stem cells <laughs> and all those kind of things and the Higgs boson, uh, which they also call the God particle and things like that. So I love going into those places. But um, a friend of mine a few years back, she told me about a study that was being done, and it was with the Tibetan monks that were incarcerated and beaten and tortured by the Chinese. And these Tibetan monks are living very youthful and healthy and vibrant lives into years beyond anyone would think after having experienced major physical trauma. However... These monks are, you know, through, so when they studied them, they started doing, you know, the physical studies on them, and what they found is that the the monks were still making stem cells. And they were, the stem cells that they were rejuvenating their body. And we've been told that, you know, we stop making some stem cells, you know, as we get older. But, you know, really what stops making stem cells is the stress that we put ourselves under. And... What was interesting is Dalai Lama was a part of the study, and he he asked one of the Tibetan monks. He was 
he asked, what's the most difficult thing you faced during this time of abuse? And the monk replied, my biggest fear was losing compassion for my enemies. These Tibetan monks, they continue to have compassion and love for their enemies. And in fact, you know why the Tibetan monks, the ones that made it through, were set free? Is because the Chinese were the ones who were being tortured because they felt so bad about what they were doing to these monks. They were suffering over punishing and torturing and and beating these monks. And these monks never changed and and went back and went after these people or said that they hated them or wanted to do anything back to them. And then they finally released the monks because of they started to have so much compassion for the monks that they said, oh, my gosh, we've got to stop doing this. We're only hurting ourselves. That is some incredible information to bring into your heart right now. And so one of the things I love to do for people is the first thing I say and at the end of my my discussions is, so right now, something that's going to make a huge difference for all of you is I want you to take a nice deep breath into your heart. Just feel it. Just take a nice deep breath into your heart and love yourself more today than you did yesterday. And when you take a nice deep breath, I want you to breathe in through your nose and I want you to expand your lungs because when we bring in that oxygen into our lungs, you know, just really do that big expansion into our lungs, our lungs are what massage our heart. And also the breath, the breath, 70% of toxins come out through the breath and the breath is what oxygenates the blood that travels through the heart, to that frequency of the heart. And so also the breath harmonizes your body, puts you back in homeostasis. It actually balances your pH because when you breathe in, you're breathing in alkalinity and you're breathing in oxygen, O2. And when we exhale, we're exhaling carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, and we're, ex- you know, we're exhaling toxins and we're exhaling acidity and actually the breath we when we inhale we're bringing in life from nature from the trees and the plants and all those things and when we're exhaling guess what we're doing we're feeding back the trees and the plants and everything one cannot be without the other we need each other that's the oneness of life and so they say the um some of the information i've received about the breath is number one, there's the the three, three, three. So three months without food and a human can die. Three weeks without water and a human can die. But three minutes without breath and a human dies. And what do we focus on the most? We focus on the food. We're always thinking about what foods we're going to eat and things like that. Then we'll focus on water. And then we'll focus on, we, we won't even focus on our breath because it's so automated. And you know the heart is what affects our autonomic nervous system. So um, the breath, um, what is said is that this ease cannot live in an oxygenated body. And oxygen is what replenishes the heart. So I, my clients that I have that I work with who come to me in pain <laughs> when I first get them, um, I occasionally work for a chiropractor, and he calls me in when some of his mo- the hardest uh, patients that he has that come in that he can't seem to move them out of pain. He'll call me and say, hey, I have someone for you. <laughs> And so when I go work with them, when I first see them also, is the first thing I ask, and this is these three questions that I'm going to share with you right now. I would love for you to write these things down because they're going to support you. Number one, where I'm going to go to first is I do ask my clients, you know, I give them self-care. And a lot of times giving self-care is about things that they need to do for themselves 
that aren't tangible. They're not like a pill box or anything like that. So a lot of time where I'm having difficulties with my my clients actually um, moving to um, a place of of harmony is they weren't really participating in their own self care. And so I asked them, many of them, I said, I asked them, why, why aren't you doing these things that I'm, I'm giving you that I know are going to help you? And they said, well, it's just not, I don't remember. I'm not remembering because there's nothing tangible there to tell me to do this, to change this way because it's so, I, I take, you know, it's so automatic, you know, breathing. You don't think about not that you're breathing shallowly and think you just know you're breathing, Right. Well, I said, what to change that? What can we do to change that? And so what we came up with is sticky notes. And this is what you can do, caregivers, you can do for yourself and for the person that you're giving, you know, who's receiving your care. Because what's really important, and I heard this from James when he was talking yesterday, what is so wonderful is when you start collaborating together, that you participate together, that you are, you know, in a companionship that you work together. And I heard um, previous to this that you were talking about partnership, finding ways that we can partner with one another and because it, it empowers us each that we are contributing to each other's happiness and joy rather than thinking that we're a burden. And I know you had a, a teleseminar earlier on that. So get your sticky notes off, out and write the word read on them. And you put them where you most spend the most time, like on your computer or, you know, on the refrigerator or wherever. So you can remind yourself to take these big, deep, deep breaths that I'm going to give you um, to do when um, I finish telling you the story about the clients that I have. So that's one of the first things I start telling people is get sticky notes and start putting information that supports you, that self-care that supports you. So you can remember to do those things. Because also I teach tapping, which is thought field therapy. Some people, there's also EFT, emotional freedom technique. I teach that, which is helps move energy blockages in the, your, your system. So a lot of times people don't remember, you know, the tap. So it's really nice to just, you know, have a sticky note that says tap, um, breathe, um, and those kind of things. So then let's get back to my clients. What happens is, when they come to me in pain and they haven't been able to move the pain out, I like to take them into a kind of an educational process um, to getting to know themselves, to get deep into their hearts. And the first thing I do is I ask them when they go, God, I'm in so much pain. The first question I ask, and this is what I'm going to ask you to ask yourself, is what would I rather have instead? What would you rather have instead of pain? Now, Ina, so yeah. when you're in pain, what would you rather have instead of pain? No pain. That's the first right. Ninety percent of people respond that way. They say no pain. But guess what? You're still focused on pain. So what's the opposite of pain? What's the reciprocal? What word stand, pops in your head first that comes to mind that is the opposite of pain? What would you rather have instead? I'm thinking, I'm thinking um, love. Okay. I'd rather have love. Now, that question, what's beautiful about that question is for a long time, you know, I was all about, you know, positive thinking and positive that. And, you know, some of my clients in, in, in the past would say to me, oh, gosh, you know, not this positive thing. And I don't want to lie to myself. I'm in friggin' pain. I don't want to lie. I don't want to have an affirmation when I'm telling me that this or that. When all it is, it makes me feel worse because I feel like I'm lying. And so I came up with that question, what would you rather have instead? Because it's not a lie. And that really helped people feel so much better. Also, words carry frequency. So love, wow, what a high frequency that is. So say that to yourself. What would you rather have instead, Ina, Dr. Ina? <laughs> what would you rather have instead of pain? Yeah, I'd rather have a lot of things. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so yeah. say the word, you know, Say, uh, so I'd rather have love. Say that to yourself. I'd rather have love, yeah. How does that feel? To say that to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're, you're, you're harmonizing your heart. So I had someone recently say serenity. And I mm. said, 
she goes, I would rather have serenity. And when she said that, you could also feel her pain level drop because it carries a frequency that harmonizes the heart. Words do. And so the next, after she said that, and so the next question you ask yourself, is this healthy for me? So what would I rather have instead? Love. Is love healthy for you? Yes. Okay. So great. So what's the adverse consequence for you having love instead of pain? None. I can't think. So I'm going to. Um, since we're getting down to the last hour, so what I want to, what time is it? Are we doing okay? Yeah. Yeah. So with that, many people, they will, so they're in pain, and sometimes there's a reason for it. So I was telling you in the very beginning my childhood trauma that I went through. And it was safer for me to be ill than it was for me to be healthy. The adverse consequence to me being healthy was being raped again. So there was a study that was done with the Thought Field Therapy Group that I was with, and there was 32 people who had IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And what they did is we taught them, each one of these 32 people, a tap that helped with anxiety and stress. And so after three months of um, 32 people using this tap, 30 of them, after three months, did not even have any signs of IBS. But we had two people who did. And so we went and interviewed them to ask them what happened when they were, um, you know, during this time that it didn't help them. And the first, both of them were women, and the first woman said, well, I didn't even use it. And we said, well, why not? And she said, well, um, I'm married to a very abusive man, and if I was healthy, I would have to have sex with him. So then the second one, she said, I started to use it, and I started to feel better. But she said, I stopped using it because if I was healthy and I was better, I would lose my disability. I can't imagine myself without disability and how I would make it in life. The adverse consequence to the first woman I just told you about was that she would be abused if she was healthy. So some people will choose that over being healthy. The second one, same thing. She has no, she doesn't. It's been so long since she's experienced being healthy that she doesn't even know that she could actually take care of herself when she's healthy and have an income and lead a, a normal life. But she couldn't see herself being that way. So when we have those three questions, to ask yourself, what is the adverse consequence to me being well? Go deep with yourself and breathe deep into your heart and love yourself more today than you did yesterday. So those three questions are what's going to help you overcome the stressors of life. And the last thing I want to share with you about neurological brain cells is the, the heart. They say there's two, we have two brains, and the heart is the first brain, actually, and the heart feeds the brain. In fact, it's two-thirds neurological brain cells is in the heart, and that's, you know, like I said, the communicator. And it passes through, actually, the vagus nerve also is fed through from the heart through the vocal cords. And when it passes through the vocal cords, guess what happens? the frequency of your heart is being expressed through your voice. And that's where bioacoustics, voice profiling, and all those things come in because it can tell the state of your health from the frequency of your heart. And your heart reaches out to everything around you. Now, I have a, when you guys get your gift from me, I have a video from HeartMath about the heart intelligence on there that I really encourage you to watch because you will understand how you as a caregiver, how your heart and your the receiver of your care are affecting one another, even when you're not even present with one another. So I really am going to suggest that you watch that video, and there's also a lot of other information on there about the heart. And 
to end this before I give you your um, where you can get your gift from, I am going to ask everybody, when you take a nice deep breath, I want you to breathe in from the nose and breathe deep into your heart and love yourself more today than you did yesterday. And when you exhale, let go of your breath, you know, as if it's the end of the day, like you just finished off the day and you're sitting down in a comfy chair and you go, ah, and just let your mouth come open and even make a sound because the sounds that our bodies make, our body responds to the sounds that our body makes, such as our heartbeat. So when you take another deep breath, and ah, just make that sound that I got, I'm all done with that. And know you're releasing that negativity, that acidity, that lactic acid, all that, those toxins. And take another deep breath. And ah. Now many people, they, they try to control the breath. And I always say, stop trying to control life and start living it. It's great advice for anyone. We're getting down to the last part. So there's one thing, you know, the language of love, the language of the heart, that is multi-universal <laughs> or universal because the heart, the, the um, heart symbol, you can take anywhere in the world and people know what it means. So to summarize this, listen with ears of tolerance, see through eyes of compassion, speak with the language of love. Now you can harmonize life through waves of emotions. Begin to adapt to change with ease even during difficult times. A change of heart will help you experience a happier, healthier life with a greater quality of living as well as those you care for. So thank you for taking the time to take this wilderness adventure into your heart to discover you. So let's catch the wave of loving consciousness the wave of harmonics and harmonize your life. So thank you so much for asking me to be here so I could share this information with you and some of my experiences with life and, and take that time to really look inside yourself, get to know yourself, feel your heart, take some time to feel because no feeling, no healing. And some people might have asked me, you know, gosh, what if I'm feeling anger? Feel it. Express it because you don't want to keep it down inside there. That hardens the arteries. It hardens your heart. And what happens there is heart disease. Express yourself. And, and again, no feeling, no healing. Begin to feel again. We've been shut off and desensitized by all of what's been going on in our world, and it's time for you to really feel because once you start feeling first before you think, you make wiser choices. So I say get out of your head and into your heart because your heart is so much wiser than your brain. So again, thank you so much for joining me and uh, giving me this opportunity to be here and teach thank you, you about Cynthia. heart models. Thank you, mm -hmm. Cynthia, for being here. Yes, we have, one, we have one comment from Joseph who said, okay. this is a great presentation. I really like the butterfly story. It's something for me to keep in mind. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Joseph. And yeah, thank you, Joseph. And um, I just want to end with one last um, little quote. Genius is the ability to renew one's emotions in daily experiences. And I always say love creates all life through its desire for experience. Thank you. That's beautiful. That's a great way to end. And thank you so much for sharing all of your expertise with us that you did tonight. I know this has been a very moving presentation for me and I'm sure for all of the caregivers that have been here, just totally amazing and lots of information. I have notes on three pages, so um, this is just amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Cynthia. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a beautiful evening. You too.